Stanford University. I want to thank uh, the organizer for inviting me here. I'm actually a good friend with uh, Juan Carlos. I offered to switch, but there's only 10 minutes uh, difference, so it's not going to help that much. Uh, but it's a great pleasure for me to be here, and um, I'm going to talk about the work that we've been doing over the past um, uh, 10, or, uh, 10 years or so. Uh, this is my uh, disclosure uh, slide. I have some um, uh, company uh, contracts uh, as well. Um, so I'm a cardiologist uh, by training, and I just want to start off by this slide showing that uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of uh, killer uh, morbidity and mortality in the U.S., uh, much farther uh, ahead compared to cancer, accidents, and uh, lung disease, as well as diabetes and uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease. So uh, we've been, uh, I, I joined Stanford in 2004, and back in 2004, we've been trying to use uh, human embryonic stem cells to understand uh, cardiac uh, developmental biology, and the thought process is that uh, once we isolate the inner cell mass uh, with these uh, human ear cells, we can then differentiate them to uh, cardiomyocytes and figure out what's going on. Now, back then, I must admit that we were mainly interested in using these human ear cells for transplantation purposes. Uh, meaning that you can see here, uh, this is in 2004, we're seeing some twitching right here, and as a dumb cardiologist, uh, the idea is to take these uh, heart cells and inject into patients uh, with heart disease. So this is in 2004, and I think the paradigm changed dramatically, or the landscape uh, changed dramatically in 2006, 2007, uh, when Shenya uh, came up with the uh, concept of the iPS cells. I think it has revolutionized the way that we think about uh, stem cell research uh, because, as I told you before, we were interested in transplantation, but then we were limited uh, by the FDA as well as uh, the federal government with the number of lines that we can work with. Now I can go to the clinic, uh, my cardiology clinic, and I can recruit a whole bunch of uh, patients with different cardiovascular diseases and I can really try to understand the mechanism of disease, right? It's very difficult to understand the mechanism of disease if you're a human uh, ESL line, the 70 of them, about 20 of them are usable, and you don't know which one of them have uh, cardiovascular disease. I can then, uh, because of the increased number of patients, I can then use them for drug toxicity uh, testing. I'll give you examples of how uh, we've been doing with uh, each one of these uh, platforms. So in terms of uh, cardiomyo uh, uh, cardiac disease, I will focus mostly on cardiomyopathies. I think our uh, speaker for tomorrow, a good friend of mine, Leo Gepstein, he'll probably talk more in terms of uh, channelopathy uh, diseases. In cardiomyopathy, there are primary costs and secondary costs. Uh, primary cause refers to something that's a genetic. If one example would be ARVD, another example would be hypertrophic dilated cardiomyopathy. The secondary cause would be like radiation-induced uh, cardiomyopathy or viral-induced uh, cardiomyopathy or other types of uh, uh, cardiomyopathy that are quote-unquote acquired. Um, we've been uh, working on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for several reasons. Uh, one is that this is the most uh, prevalent uh, cardiovascular, inherited cardiovascular disease affects one in about 500 uh, people. Uh, there have been more than 500 mutations identified across about 27 genes. Uh, clinically, it's uh, characterized by outflow tract obstruction due to the mitral valve hitting against the uh, septum and also arrhythmias. And I think it's actually one of the most uh, common causes of sudden cardiac death in young adults. So this is a diagnosis of exclusion for cardiologists if somebody uh, dropped dead. And I've listed here uh, because I'm interested, uh, I play basketball in my spare time. Uh, the uh, basketball, uh, professional basketball athletes and also college uh, basketball athletes who have died uh, due to hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy uh, here. Um, so we, uh, probably two to three years ago, we were able to obtain a large family uh, in which the uh, mother has the disease. And uh, f lucky for us, uh, she had eight kids, and that's so lucky for her, she has uh, eight kids. And uh, so kid number one, two, three, and seven has the mutation, and by DNA sequencing, it's all getting to a histidine switch, a myosin heavy chain seven mutation, very common uh, mutation. Kid number one and two, uh, by MRI, already has a very, very thick septum, and it's quite interesting, kid three and seven has the mutation, but uh, does not have the uh, thick septum on the MRI, and telling you that there's quite a bit of heterogeneity between the phenotype and the genotype. We're able to uh, get the skin, make the iPS cells, differentiate them to cardiomyocytes, and 
uh, probably at that time we were not sure that this is actually a true uh, result, meaning that the patients uh, who had the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy they actually had bigger cell size uh, compared to the patient who uh, did not. Uh, these are the control siblings. We couldn't believe the data, so we repeated several times and many, many uh, times. And each time when we do it, we always get the same data. That is, the hypertrophic patient had much bigger size compared to the uh, control patients. They're also more uh, multinucleated uh, compared to the control patients. You can challenge them with the drug. Uh, in this case, uh, isoproteinol, which is a catecholamine agent to simulate the patient's exercising. Because clinically, we also tell these patients not to exercise uh, too much. And you can show that the isoproteinol aggravate the hypertrophic uh, phenotype. We also did a whole bunch of studies to uh, figure out what the pathway of this uh, particular disease is and show that there's uh, activation of the MFAC signaling and that you can come in with calcineal inhibitors such as cyclosporin A and FK506 to reverse uh, the phenotype. Now, uh, so as I showed you uh, before, uh, the cells are bigger. And one of the things about cardiology is that we have a lot of drugs out there that we already give to patients. And so in this case here, we give a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, uh, verapamil. And you can see that by giving verapamil, you can cut down the size of the uh, cardiomyocytes. The cells have arrhythmias uh, right here by, by the uh, irregular calcium transients. So these are untreated. You can see all these irregularities. And by giving verapamil, you can cut that down. And likewise, uh, these cells have more delayed after depolarizations. And by giving verapamil, you can cut it down. And again, verapamil is one of the medications that we give uh, to these uh, patients, especially when they show up as uh, pediatric uh, 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 patients. So I think it took us about three years to kind of tease out all the uh, pictures, and what we think is happening is the mutation, the myosin chain 7 mutation, increased intracellular calcium affinity, increased intracellular calcium, activates the infect signaling, leads to hypertrophic response, and there's also calcium handling uh, defects, uh, with the uh, which leads to arrhythmias. And you can come in with beta blockers, such as propanolol, to block it here. You can come in with antiarrhythmic drugs, lidocaine, mesilotin, and ranilogen, uh, to block the arrhythmias here. You can come in with calcineal in, uh, inhibitors, such as cyclosporin and AFK506 to block here. And likewise, you can come in with the verapamil to block the initial uh, pathway right here. So this then uh, gave us, uh, for the, I would say for the first time, the unprecedented ability to get tons and tons of patients' cardiomyocyte and help us to figure out what's going on in terms of the disease pathways and also for drug screening, which I'll show you later. Uh, another example is uh, familial dilated cardiomyopathy. It's the most uh, common cause of a heart transplant in uh, infants as well as in young adults. Um, you know, back about 30 years ago in the 1980s, uh, a lot of these patients were thought to be idiopathic uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, idiopathic is just a fancy term that physicians don't know what's going on. Uh, and by 2005, uh, with the advance of uh, next generation sequencing, up to about 35 to 40 percent of these patients initially diagnosed to be idiopathic are uh, found to be uh, uh, familiar dilated cardiomyopathy. And on the echocardiogram here, you will see uh, the heart is very big. It's just not squeezing uh, here uh, as well. And we also, uh, because of our access to the uh, cardiovascular clinic at Stanford, were able to obtain these uh, patients. And in this particular case here, it's a three-generation family. Uh, by a DNA sequencing, it's a uh, troponin T mutation with the arginine to tryptophan switch. The grandmother has a disease. Uh, she had two kids, uh, uh, two sons who had the disease. And one of her grandsons already had the heart transplant, and then we were able to confirm the uh, mutation by uh, DNA sequencing. And likewise, uh, we did similar studies. Uh, one study is to use the uh, atomic force microscopy, in which it's a single cantilever sitting on a single cardiomyocyte. And as the cardiomyocyte squeezes, the cantilever will move up and down. The motion of the cantilever allows us to indirectly calculate the amount of force uh, generated by the uh, cardiac cells. And you can see that the uh, control uh, patients have this amount of force. The dilated patients have this amount of force. You can give circa 2A uh, to rescue the uh, force. And likewise, you can give uh, metoprolol uh, in the presence of a stress, norepinephrine stress, to cut down the amount of the uh, disorganized uh, myofibrils uh, right here. 
uh, just like the hypertrophic patient, this then allows us to figure out the mechanisms and also as well as the screen for drugs. So um, to make a very long story short, we generated iPS cells from a seven-member family with DCM and the mutations at the troponin T mutation, very, very common mutation uh, in uh, these kind of patients. We're able to uh, kind of figure out that these uh, disease cells had altered regulation of the calcium ion. Decrease, which leads to decreased contractility as well as the abnormal distribution of the uh, salcomeric alpha actinin. And that you can then come in with the uh, metoprolol or zinc therapy to improve the function of these cells, recapitulating the uh, results from large, uh, multi, uh, multiple uh, large beta blocker trials as well as the recent Cupid trial. The Cupid trial is a trial done by Roger Hadras group in Mount Sinai in which he's giving patients with AAV virus uh, driving circa 2A to improve the contractility of the uh, heart right here. So what we think is going to happen uh, is that um, this is really a paradigm shift in that you're able to study disease mechanism in a dish. Traditionally, it's not possible to get access to the heart cells, and even if you get access to the heart cells, uh, these uh, cells die uh, when you grow them in a dish. Now we can get it from different populations of patients, generate the heart cells, and do all these type of uh, screening assays. And one of the things about cardiology is, is that these cells, uh, just uh, uh, in the field of cardiology, we have a lot of assays to measure what's going on with the patient's heart. Likewise, in iPS cells, it's an easier uh, reader for us because the reader is whether the cells be faster, slower, stronger, weaker whether the cells be regular, irregular. So we can measure all of that, and we can come in with drugs uh, that can modify that as well. I want to shift gear to this uh, drug discovery, uh, as well as a drug uh, uh, screening, and this is uh, quite relevant to the, uh, this uh, particular meeting sponsored by uh, Takeda Pharmaceuticals. I think, as you know, the uh, pharmaceutical industry is, quote, unquote, in danger, and this is uh, because, at least in the U.S., uh, the new drug requires about $1.8 billion and about two, 12 years on average to uh, go from conception to the clinical release. And the major reason for this inefficiency is due to uh, the, uh, the preclinical test that you get does not equal to uh, clinical uh, events, and that the cardiac toxicity is the number one cause of a drug withdrawal post-marketing. You know, I've always uh, made the joke that, which is, uh, I think it's real, I've always made the joke that, uh, you know, if you're a pharmaceutical company, you come up with a drug and you give it to a patient and the patient gets a rash, uh, you probably don't care the patient gets a rash. On the other hand, if you give it to a patient and the next day the patient doesn't wake up, you care because somebody's going to get sued. Yeah, so this is a big issue that the cardiac toxicity is the number one cause of drug withdrawal post-marketing. Um, so I listed uh, some of the drugs that have been withdrawn uh, from the market because of this particular issue. Uh, I highlighted uh, Cisapri uh, because uh, myself, uh, when I was a health staff, I probably given out about 500 prescriptions of Cisapri. We gave it to patients with diabetes who have problem digesting or diabetic gastroparesis. It helped them uh, digest the food better. The drug worked wonderful, except I was withdrawn in 2000 because of long QT issues and 80 people died from this and the FDA had to withdraw the uh, drug uh, from the market. Now, if you were to take a step back and try to figure out that uh, how does a drug company do the uh, drug screening? The drug company does not have access to your heart cells. They do not have access. Uh, it's very difficult to grow the neonatal rat or mouse uh, cardiomyocytes. It's just way too labor intensive. And so what the drug company do is, uh, as uh, Dr. Yamanaka was mentioning yesterday, they'll take a cell lines, such as a Chinese hamster ovary cell line or the um, human embryonic kidney cell line, and they overexpress uh, the cell line with a channel. In this case th here, they uh, overexpress it with the HERC uh, channel, which is uh, basically a delayed potassium rectifying uh, uh, channel, and they do all this uh, drug screening on this uh, particular assay. So if you have a drug that acts on the HERC channel, uh, then it will come out to be positive. If you have a drug that acts on another channel, it will come out to be negative because it has no effect on the HERC channel. Most of the drugs, or a lot of the drugs that we take, actually hits on multiple channels. Sometimes they cancel each other out, so there's no, uh, no toxicity on the patients. 
if it happens to hit on this channel plus this channel plus this channel, the test will come out to be positive, meaning that the drug uh, will probably be killed because of the uh, toxicity right here. So as I explain here, uh, this, uh, this is probably the reason why this is a uh, big headache for the FDA in terms of figuring out how do you do uh, proper uh, drug screening. Uh, so uh, we've been uh, working, as I told you ba uh, back about 10 years ago, we've been uh, trying to figure out uh, how do you take human ESL, differentiate the cardiomyocytes. So over the past uh, 10 years, I think the protocol has improved uh, dramatically. And i uh, just shown here that in the beginning, uh, it was more of an embryo body uh, technique. And later on, it's kind of gradually transformed into a monolayer uh, cardiac differentiation technique. And because of time, I won't go over the intricate details of what are the steps that are involved in each one of these uh, steps uh, here. But I do must say that uh, this is what we get uh, back in 2004. Uh, and this is uh, using uh, human ear cells. And you can see that there's something that twitched right here. And they are very happy uh, back in 2004 when something uh, twitched. Uh, I think in 2013, 2012, we can very, very reliably get 90% plus uh, cardiomyocytes uh, from everybody. And instead of using human ear cells, now we switch to uh, either fibroblasts or using uh, blood uh, cells uh, uh, and then differentiate, uh, make iPSL. And this is uh, based on a protocol that uh, Dr. Lin Zhao uh, Chen has, and then differentiate them to cardiomyocytes right here. And so once we get the cardiomyocytes, we also need to make sure that uh, this is what we're seeing. And this is a slightly complicated slide, so I'll uh, explain uh, what we're looking at. So we need to show, and this is by RNA sequencing, that the cardiac cells that we generate has inter-individual heterogeneity and intra-individual homogeneity. In this case here, we generated iPSL cardiomyocytes from six different patients. Each patient, we create two clones, differentiate the cardiomyocyte, and do sequencing on them. And to show that the cardiomyocyte cluster together right here, except for this one right here, and that uh, this, this is important because if I make cardiomyocyte for myself versus, let's say, my wife, and all cardiomyocytes look exactly the same, then it's no good because I can't do this with drug uh, screening. You can't tease out one person versus another. Here it's showing you that there's inter-individual heterogeneity and there's intra-individual homogeneity. My cardiomyocytes look the same as mine. look different from Dr. Yamanaka. I look different from another person. And so with, based on this data, then we're able to go and uh, start doing a lot of these uh, drug screening assays. Uh, this is a complicated slide, but I'll uh, walk, you, uh, walk through the slide right here. This is N equals three patients for control patients, three long QT patients, three hypertrophic patients, and three dilated uh, cardiomyopathy patients. And I showed you earlier that I had used a cisapride before the drug was withdrawn from the market because of the long QT. So if you give cisapride uh, at the one nanomole, a very low dose, nothing happens. You can already see that the long QT patients have longer action potential, which makes sense because these are the long QT patients. You give very high dose, you will get arrhythmia in all these uh, patients uh, right here. And somewhere right here at 30 nanomolar, you will see arrhythmias in long QT patients and hypertrophic patients but not in control and not in dilated cardiomyopathy patient. This is quite interesting to us because we've always tried to figure out why is it that cisapride was given to more than 10 million people and out of those 10 million people, only 400 cases of a long QT, only 80 death. And probably uh, in retrospect, is that the people who die or people who had issues with it, in our opinion, were most likely long QT patients and hypertrophic patients. And that's the reason why these guys got into trouble, and that most of us, if you and I were to take it, nothing would happen because we're quote unquote considered control uh, patient. And obviously, this kind of hypothesis will need uh, further testing in the future. And I think if you're a drug company and had access to this type of data, you could also try to say, well, you know, we have to be careful with these type of patients and maybe perhaps uh, put a black box uh, warning on the drug that anybody who were to take this medication would need a baseline uh, either EKG or baseline echo just to make sure that they don't have hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. I'll give you another example. This is uh, uh, using a comparison of the HERC testing versus human iPSL cardiomyocyte testing. And we took a verapamil. Verapamil is a calcium channel blocker, a very, very common drug uh, that we use for hypertension uh, patients. If you give a verapamil to patients, uh, to uh, HERC, uh, to CHO cells with the HERC channel, 
you will see the IC50 is very low. That tells you that this is toxic, right? CHO cells, uh, the variable effects of Herc channel increases long QT, not safe. You give it to an iPA cell derived cardiomyocyte, and uh, it affects the Herc channel, but the, the verapamil also affects the L type calcium channel. It's an L type calcium channel blocker, which shortens QT. So it hits on multiple channels, and at the end of the day, it's quote unquote safe. And so um, if you look at this, uh, this is an example of a false positive readout based on the CHO test. So this drug would have been killed in the market in the uh, preclinical uh, testing because of this uh, readout right here, uh, because you know, it's uh, quote unquote uh, low IC50. The reason why we use this drug is that this drug of Arapamil has been around since 1980s. It's FDA approved uh, for hypertension, uh, for uh, chest pain, and for arrhythmias. And the CHO test uh, with the Herc channel came about in 1990s. So it's, you know, it, it happened before the uh, CHO test uh, came about. And that's why the, re uh, the reason why this drug is in the market. We've also been testing uh, other drugs. Uh, one, another example is alfuzosin. Alfuzosin is, uh, some of you, uh, I guess the older audience here in the, uh, here may be taking this. This is a, a BPH of a benign prostate uh, hypertrophy drug. And you can see that if you take uh, alfuzosin and put it in the chilled uh, cells with the Herc channel, the IC50 is pretty high. And it tells you it's quote unquote, it's a safe uh, drug. It's, uh, and on the other hand, um, if you uh, put it in IPA cell derived cardiomyocyte, the IC50 is much lower. It tells you it's not a safe drug. And the main reason is this, the, as I say, the Herc channel only tests for potassium uh, channel. And the, uh, the drug right here uh, actually uh, affects uh, the sodium channel. And this is the reason why uh, this is an example of a false negative test in which the drug says uh, the testing with the chill, uh, uh, Herc channel says it's safe, but in a human iPSL cardiomyocyte, it's actually uh, not safe. And alfuzosin necessarily is a BPH drug that delays the cardiac repolarization not by blocking uh, the Herc channel, but actually by increasing the sodium current. And uh, post-marketing, uh, the FDA found this out, and this is the reason why there's a black box warning right here in the drug, uh, and says that if you have uh, long QT, uh, you should be uh, worried, uh, you should be careful in terms of taking this uh, particular uh, drug right here. Now, what I've shown you is mostly by single cell patching, and this is uh, quite labor intensive. Uh, we have an interest in terms of uh, doing this on a high throughput uh, basis. And so we've been working with uh, Steve uh, Quake at Stanford uh, in which using his uh, single cell uh, platform to do uh, this type of high throughput, uh, throughput analysis. And the idea is that you can put in one cell here and assay for 96 uh, genes at a time. Uh, Steve has actually come up with a single cell RNA sequencing uh, platform. This is a single cell PCR platform that I show you. I think for the single cell RNA sequencing, uh, we kind of play with it, just give us way too much uh, data and it's too cumbersome to analyze the data. And so I think for what we want to do, which is drug screening, uh, this is enough. And this is what we typically uh, get. Uh, this is uh, looking at channels, major channels. All of these listed are major channels. You drop a, a cell here and uh, you can assay that the hex cells, the human embryonic kidney cells, for example, has no K-chip 2. The adult LV has K-chip 2. Uh, the human iPSL, ESL derived uh, cardiomyocyte have K-chip 2. And then the undifferentiated cells has no K-chip 2. And you can then do this for you know, 500,000 uh, uh, patients and figure out how the cells uh, look like at different stages and also different uh, patient populations. I'll also give you another example of uh, uh, another platform that we're developing, and this is using bioluminescence uh, imaging at uh, the screen for drug therapy uh, for viral cardiomyopathy, and in particular, uh, the B3 Kasaki virus. This is the most common cause of uh, viral cardiomyopathy, and this is uh, using the uh, B3 Kasaki virus as expressing the luciferase. You can hit these cells. The amount of the luciferase expression uh, tells you how much uh, uh, transfection uh, by the virus. And then uh, you can then come in with different drugs that you want to figure out w which one of these drugs work in terms of preventing this uh, viral uh, uh, myocarditis. And I've listed some drugs uh, here. And this is what the uh, platform will look like uh, in which when you transfect the cells, uh, the cells will light up. 
And as you increase uh, the dose of the uh, drug right here, uh, in this case here we took uh, ribavirin, you can see ribavirin at uh, 800 micromolar was significantly cut down the amount of transfection right here. So this gives you an assay to figure out what drugs that you can use to uh, prevent uh, this particular type of uh, viral myocarditis. And so this is our effort at the Stanford Cardiovascular Institute. Um, we have a goal uh, to create a bank of about 1,000 cardiac IPS lines uh, for drug discovery. And I didn't show you some data, the data, but we're also using TAN and CRISPR uh, for genome editing. And so that uh, this is mainly to confirm and also later on to replace uh, some of the patient uh, recruitment that we'll do. Uh, we do DNA-seq, RNA-seq on all these uh, lines, and uh, we work with uh, Russ Altman at Stanford uh, to use the PharmGK database uh, to figure out uh, how the human genetic variation impacts the uh, drug response phenotypes. Uh, we link it to the STRIDE database. Uh, the STRIDE database is the Stanford Translational Research Integrated Database Environment, so that each patient that we generate at Stanford, we will have the cardiac data, such as echo or EKG or carotid ultrasound, abdominal ultrasound. And then we're going to try to provide this as a resource uh, to the NHLBI, to the FDA, and also uh, to the pharma industry. And part of this effort is uh, funded by the uh, California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, uh, tissue collection grant for accelerating IPSR research in uh, cardiovascular uh, disease. And so what we think uh, there's going to be a paradigm shift in terms of IPSL for drug discovery is that this is what happens uh, traditionally right here. It's costly and it's slow, and that in the future uh, you go from here to here, and then based on uh, the readouts that you get, you go then to here. And so that this allows you to test the safety and the efficacy of cardiac drugs uh, in our case here, 1,000 patients, uh, beating heart cells, made from different ethnicity groups. Uh, we have Asians, Hispanics, African Americans, Caucasians in our bank, different sex and different cardiovascular diseases that I sh uh, showed you uh, earlier. And that the confirmatory results can then lead to uh, phase one or phase two uh, clinical trials uh, later on right here. And for the last uh, couple minutes, I just want to briefly highlight uh, some of the uh, areas that we've been doing for cell therapy. I think the first slide I show you at the beginning of the talk was how we got into this field back in 2004. We got into this field in 2004 because, as I say, you know, as a cardiologist, we've always wanted to inject these cells into patients and see what happens. And so for the IPSL and ESL, uh, the holy grail is to do this for regenerative medicine applications. I would say that this is very, very difficult, uh, but when you talk to your investors, uh, because at the end of the day, your investors have be, to be interested to take it to the next step. The university is not going to be interested because there's too much liability. Uh, your investors uh, with the money are most interested in this area. And um, so uh, <clears throat> these are some of the trials uh, that we have uh, set up at the, adult, uh, at the Stanford Cardiovascular Institute. Uh, using adult stem cells. This is more for us like a practice run for our human ESL, human IPSL uh, trial. So we have trials involving CD, mostly CD34 uh, cells uh, in patients with chronic ischemia and also patients with the acute MI. And, um, and we're part of the uh, CCTRN uh, trial network sponsored by the NIH. And uh, well, so recently recruited uh, a CT surgery chair uh, who's also part of the uh, cardiothoracic surgery uh, trials network. And this is very important to us because we'll need to work with our cardiothoracic surgeons in terms of figuring out how to inject these cells. I'll give you an example. Uh, this is a uh, intracoronary CD34 stem cell injection in patients with non-ischemic uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. And this is enrollment. Uh, we mobilize the cells by GCSF, randomize them. I think the only difference here, uh, just uh, compared to the other clinical trials that we've done, is that we added a uh, imaging group here. So the cells attack with the imaging probe. So when we inject the cells in the patient, we can figure out where the cells go. And this allows us uh, to stratify the patients so that, in our experience, uh, the patients who have good CD34 homing as shown by the spec imaging, again, the cells attack with the radio tracers, have better function improvement uh, than those with full homing. So if I am an interventional cardiologist and I inject these cells, and most of these cells end up in the liver or in the spleen, 
I don't really expect this patient to have a better improvement, uh, but I don't know until three or four months later when we start looking at the echo MR, and at that time it's already too late. So with this type of te technique, it allows you to, at, day t uh, at 24 hours later, it allows you to figure out whether you need to re-inject cells back into this patient or not because of bad uh, injection. Now, I've always been asked uh, by other people, uh, including patients, and say, Doc, you know, why do you want to work with ESLs and iPSLs, and why not just use uh, adult stem cells? The response, you know, it takes us a long time to figure this out, but I think the best analogy is that, uh, besides uh, funding by CIRM, uh, the best analogy is that uh, uh, this is a typical 70-year-old patient with hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, had multiple stents and prior alcohol and smoking history. It's like a beat-up car, and the car's muffler is not working. And the question is then, you know, for autologous cell therapy, you're basically taking cells from the patient and put it back into the patient. So it's almost like taking the old muffler and put it back in. Uh, whereas I IPSL or ESL therapy is more like, you know, uh, using a new muffler and put it into the uh, car. Uh, so this is probably the best uh, analogy I can give uh, to my patients uh, when they ask. The problem is that this is cheap and you know it's gonna fit because you're taking it out and put it back into the car. This is very expensive and you're not sure if it's gonna fit because this is an old car and you're putting a new muffler in. And so these are the issues that we need to work with and so that were funded by the uh, CIRM, again, uh, with the disease team grant, in which at the end of four years, we're supposed to get an IND uh, to inject these cells uh, into patients. Uh, this is probably the most difficult grant I've uh, dealt with because it's not a grant, it's really a contract, and you have to figure out, for example, a lot of issues that most uh, uh, physicians or scientists are not familiar with. You know, product characterization, assay discovery, optimization of quality uh, critical assays, assay qualification, optimization of your immunosuppressive protocols and so forth. And luckily, we're, and I'm helped by uh, Joe Gold, who used to be the senior uh, regenerative biology director at Geron, and also by Larry Couture at City of Hope, who provides us with these uh, GMP-grade uh, cells. And so we're working on this, and I'll show you some of the issues that we've run into and how we're going to address uh, these uh, issues. One of the issues is the tumor genicity. This gets asked uh, all the time uh, by the reviewers, uh, and also, uh, you know, we as clinicians have to figure out uh, how do you address this. We think that this is actually pretty low risk, but it needs to be absolutely 0% risk. Otherwise, the entire field is going to be doomed, uh, just like the gene therapy uh, trial with the uh, adenovirus. There's no data on long-term follow-up in small and large animal models. And, uh, and when I talk about lo uh, long-term follow-up, we're talking about years, not uh, months. And then how do you make sure that there's no undifferentiated cells within the 50 to 200 million cells that you're planning to inject into a patient? And how do you detect the tumor in vivo uh, before patients show up uh, is, uh, with the abnormal symptoms? And this, these are some of the uh, 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 concepts that we've been uh, working on. And because of time, I won't go into the individual uh, uh, papers that we published. And then uh, also the challenges of, uh, the, another challenge is the immunogenicity aspect. I would say that for many iPSL-based uh, therapies, at least for the cardiac field, it's most likely going to be allogeneic therapy. It's not going to be autologous uh, for the cardiac, I think, in the beginning. And it, this is because of the big pharma's focus on return on, on investment. They're not interested in taking your cell and put it back into you and sell it to one person. They're interested in taking my cell and qualify it, or somebody's cells qualify and give it to everybody, and so that there's high return on investment. In our experience, the conventional immunosuppressive drugs that are used uh, for uh, preventing rejection of vascularized organ, uh, especially the heart, actually do not work quite well. So we're trying to figure out what's the uh, best uh, way to do this. And as I say here, this is a big headache for us, uh, no good solution yet. We're still working on this uh, issue. And then the last area I would say is the large animal models. Uh, so the FDA has asked us for two uh, animal models. Uh, one is rodent and then the other one is a large animal model. And so we've done this in a, uh, in a dog model as well as a pig model. And uh, this is very expensive to do, uh, large animal studies. It's more than $100 a day of housing at Stanford. So each day I pay $100 uh, per cage per, uh, per dog or per uh, pig. 
it's very difficult to get NIH funding because it's not mechanistic enough. Uh, showing efficacy in large randomized double-blinded studies uh, requires large patient size. So I put this down right here. Who's going to pay for this? And so that's why you have to figure it out, that you, know, you have to get people uh, motivated, interested. In cardiology, the in vitro potency that you measure does not equal to in vivo efficacy, which does not equal to improved morbidity and mortality. If you have heart failure, I can give you dobutamine that causes your heart to squeeze stronger. So there's in vitro uh, efficacy. There's also in vivo efficacy. But there's no, in vivo, uh, there's no uh, improvement because dobutamine long-term use actually kills you. And so this is, a, uh, this is a difficult issue that we need to figure out, especially with these uh, cardiac stem cell trials. So I just want to summarize uh, by uh, showing you examples of what we've done with these cardiac iPS cells in the areas of disease modeling, uh, in the areas of uh, drug discovery and pharmacogenomics, and also in the areas of uh, the stem cell uh, therapy. And um, I also want to acknowledge the uh, postdocs in my lab. I actually have a a uh, Japanese uh, postdoc from Kyo University uh, who's working on uh, LV non-compaction because of time uh, issues. I won't go in, uh, I didn't go into this. My collaborators at Stanford, co collaborators outside of Stanford, uh, my funding support. And I'll end with this slide here. We do have a cardiovascular regenerative medicine a symposium next year. This is open to the public, and it's, at the, uh, uh, it's on May 28th, uh, 2014. And again, I want to conclude by uh, saying thanks to everybody. It's, it's been a great meeting, and I'll be happy to take any uh, questions. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.